the far seat. The far seat. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Stephen Sequera. I'm the Secretary of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. Welcome this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, the distinguished professor, Noam Chomsky, who will uh, take your questions. Um, but to present him, I have our Vice Chair of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People, Ambassador Zahir Tanin. Ambassador Tanin, you have the floor. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to this press conference. The Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People is honored to host uh, within the framework of the International Year of Solidarity with the Palestinian People such an important event as today's with exceptional guests. On behalf of the Palestinian Rights Committee, I am very pleased to welcome Professor Noam Chomsky, though I am uh, certain he needs no introductions. Professor Chomsky is undoubtedly one of the most prominent critical thinkers of our time. His extensive study and work on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over the past uh, 40 years uh, could not be more relevant and pertinent than at this particular juncture. Professor uh, Chomsky will deliver a lecture at 3 p.m. in the General Assembly. In the General Assembly Hall, uh, previously it was informed to all uh, that was Ecosockets General Assembly Hall on the prospects for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts in light of recent events. His lecture will be followed by a discussion and Q&A session with uh, Amy Goodman, a journalist and host at Democracy Now. Professor Chomsky will now first give a short statement, after which we will open the floor for questions from the media. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, look forward to uh, discussing whatever issues you have on your mind and would like to bring up. So I'll keep to a very brief statement. That <laughs> floor is yours. I regret. Uh, so please keep your questions brief and to the point, and he'll answer them one by one. Please, go ahead. Uh, Professor Chomsky, uh, on behalf of uh, the UN Correspondent Association, you're welcome and thank you for being here. The Palestinian leadership is calling now uh, 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 on the Security Council to adopt a resolution uh, to, to end the uh, occupation within a two years time frame. Uh, do you think that uh, the Security Council should take such action? Thank you. I think the Security Council should take that action, and indeed stronger actions, but uh, as I needn't tell you, the Security Council can only act insofar as the great powers permit, and in this case that means insofar as the United States permits. And uh, my suspicion is that uh, the U.S. delegation will seek ways to block any such resolution, though I think it's certainly appropriate, the resolution, that is. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chomsky. Uh, I wonder what moral position would you take if you were a Palestinian and you have the choice under the occupation and you have the Islamic uh, state that you see nowadays and the Arab author uh, 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 authoritarian regimes, what is the choice that you take 
the moral one. The moral choice for the Palestinians? Yeah, thank you. Well, the moral choice is uh, to resist the occupation. Uh, they have limited options. Uh, the moral choices cannot be divorced from uh, the, con the tactical uh, judgments about the consequences of actions. So there's no such thing as moral choices in a universe divorced from the one in which we exist. And in the universe in which we exist, the uh, moral choices are um, limited. Uh, but they are not non-existent uh, for... Actually, I've been... I've had uh, uh, various uh, involvements with the Palestinian leadership for maybe 45 years. And I think... Uh, uh, original, uh, initially through uh, my friend Edward Said, who close friend, arranged meetings. We had discussions, and uh, my feeling all along is that the uh, primary uh, focus of the Palestinian leadership uh, should be, or at least a primary focus, to uh, address the American population. As I think there will be no significant progress in this conflict until pressure from the American population uh, induces the government to take a different stance. And every uh, uh, third world nationalist movement, uh, Vietnamese, Nicaraguan, Timorese, whatever it was, uh, ha have all understood the significance of developing uh, solidarity and support among the American population to the extent that they can influence uh, modification of policy. And I think that's a, a, a crucial direction that the Palestinian efforts should be directed to, quite apart from actions in the international arena. So, for example, uh, yesterday's uh, vote in the British Parliament is an illustration of the kind of step that can be taken that can add to the growing effort to uh, pressure the, the influential states in the world. Unfortunately, it's not an egalitarian world. The ones who have more influence to uh, use that influence to advance uh, settlement of the uh, conflict, which is within reach, and we pretty well know what it is. Gentleman in the second row. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Chomsky. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayan from the daily Al-Quds al arabi that's based in London. And my question, Mr. Chomsky, is the two-state solution still viable? Do you believe that there is any chance left for a second state in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, that is viable, independent, sovereign, contiguent, and independent? Truly, is there a chance? Is there a chance for a two-state settlement with an independent, uh, viable Palestinian state? Yeah, there's a chance, and I don't think it's hard to see how it could be reached. Uh, it's, come, it's come fairly close a number of times. So, for example, the Taba negotiations in uh, January uh, 2001 approached a settlement that might have been viable. In fact, uh, as you may recall, in the final press conference of the negotiators, Israeli and Palestinian, they did in inform the press that if they had a bit more time, they might have actually settled uh, the remaining issues. There were several outstanding issues remaining. And although uh, lots, has, lots has happened since then, I don't see uh, any reason to doubt that a settlement roughly along the lines that they were discussing uh, could be implemented. Uh, it will require that, as I said before, that uh, the United States uh, be willing to accept such a settlement. So far, that hasn't happened. I mean, as you know, uh, just uh, three years ago, President Obama vetoed a Security Council resolution. His delegation vetoed a Security Council resolution which called for the implementation of official U.S. policy. Uh, as long as that continues to be the stance, I think there will be one roadblock after another.
Sure. Uh, th uh, thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks a lot for this briefing. I wanted to ask, you know, you, obviously the U.S. has a veto in the Security Council, as do the other four, and they had a veto in choosing Ban Ki-moon as the Secretary General and him being re renewed. Now that he's in his second term, I wonder how do you, just since you're here at the U.N., how do you view sort of the U.N. Secretariat, UNRWA, the whole kind of U.N. machinery on the question of Palestine, how do you, do you view it as, as even-handed between the two sides or, or as, so, and the other, if you're willing to go once beyond Palestine, is, I'd love to hear your analysis of the Kobani, the situation in Kobani in, in, in Syria with the Kurds, but only if time permits. Thank you. Well, the situation, of, of, with regard to the UN leadership, one has to always qualify. There's a certain range of options open to the UN leadership, but obviously the UN cannot proceed beyond the bounds permitted by the great powers. And in this particular case, Israel-Palestine, that means primarily the United States. The record of uh, is overwhelming and very clear for uh, uh, 50, almost 50 years. Uh, the, and I think uh, within those bounds, the UN leadership has done uh, about what it could. I mean, you can criticize this or that uh, judgment, but uh, uh, the limits are fairly narrow. Uh, as I just mentioned, there was even a U.S. veto of a resolution uh, endorsing official U.S. policy. Uh, that's pretty extreme and indicates what the limits are once again. With regard to Kobani, uh, it's a shocking situation. Uh, this morning's newspaper uh, as you read, uh, described a Turkish military operation against Kurds in Turkey, not against ISIS a couple of kilometers across the border uh, where they're in danger of being slaughtered. Uh, as long as uh, uh, I think the UN, something should be done at the UN at least in terms of a very strong resolution to... Uh, a call for a, a ceasefire. It's hard to impose the use of force, but to the extent that it can be done to try to protect Kobani from destruction at the hands of ISIS, which could be a major massacre with enormous consequences. The strategic significance of the town in the Kurdish region is pretty obvious. And uh, Turkey's role is critical in this. If we could try to keep questions to uh, Israel-Palestine, I'd appreciate that. Madam in the second row, please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Evelyn Leopold. Um, do you see a trend in Western Europe after Sweden and the British Parliament, which doesn't necessarily commit the UK government, toward um, recognizing Palestine <coughs> as a state, which would very much isolate the US. Uh, I'm not sure that. Uh, and secondly, um, do you see the Israeli criticism deteriorating into anti-Semitism? It doesn't mean that you have to be an anti-Semite to criticize Israel. The two, as we, you and I know, can be very separate. But do you see that trend in Europe and elsewhere? especially in the Arab world? Well, the uh, classic discussion of this was given by uh, Israel's UN ambassador, Abba Eben, uh, back about, the near, must have been around 1970. He has an interesting article, which you might want to look up. It appeared in Congress Weekly, which is a major journal of the American Jewish community, the kind of more liberal segment of the organized American Jewish community. And in that, he uh, essentially gives his instructions to the American Jewish community. And what he says is, you, your task is to convince the population and the world that any criticism of Israel is either anti-Semitism or, in the case of Jews, uh, is uh, as an indication of Jewish self-hatred. And he actually mentioned two people. One was I.F. Stone, and the other was me. So I was happy to be designated as a neurotic, self-hating Jew. Uh, actually, there's a history, which I presume Abba Eben knows, uh, 
certainly anyone with a Jewish education knows, a real Jewish education. This goes right back to the Bible. Uh, the first person to use this argument was uh, King Ahab, Kings too. He was the epitome of evil in the Bible. And uh, Ahab and Jezebel, everyone knows the story. Uh, at one point, he, uh, the king called the prophet Elijah to him uh, and uh, demanded of the prophet uh, that he, uh, uh, he condemned the prophet Elijah as the Hebrew phrase is Ocher Yisrael. A bright translation would be hater of Israel. He asked him, why are you a hater of Israel? Uh, what the prophet was doing, of course, was condemning the uh, acts of the evil king. And for the totalitarian mentality, the power center is identified with the society, the culture, you know, the community, and so on. So if you condemn the power center, you're condemning the country, the nation, the history, and the culture. So the prophet Elijah was a hater of Israel. And the person who issued the condemnation was the uh, epitome of evil in the Bible. So we have a choice. Do we want to join Elijah or do we want to join King Ahab, as uh, Abba Abin recommended? As for the first part of your question, I think uh, the, the British vote yesterday was, as the press correctly pointed out, symbolic. The Conservative Party essentially abstained following Israel's request that they uh, ignore the vote. Uh, and uh, the Prime Minister Cameron made it clear, stated that this would not affect British policy. However, it does affect British policy. Uh, it's another indication of the way uh, the populations in Europe, and also in the United States to an extent, not as far, but it's moving in that direction, are uh, uh, want to distance themselves from the uh, actions that Israel is taking, which are very explicitly criminal actions. There's no question about it. They're in violation of direct orders of the Security Council, of uh, the judgment of the World Court. Uh, there's no higher authorities. Uh, they want to distance themselves from those actions, both their criminality and their brutality. And our, uh, every society, in particular more somewhat more democratic ones like Britain and the United States, uh, sooner or later the uh, 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 attitudes of the population can, they may not, but they can uh, influence the direction of policy if there's effort and engagement in that direction. And what we saw in the case of Sweden explicitly and uh, now tentatively in England, and I, there was a comment by the French foreign minister that they might be contemplating something like that in the future. I think that's a direction in which things are going to go. Uh, as you know, there are already, I think, uh, over 130 countries that do recognize Palestine. Uh, Sweden is the first one in Europe. And uh, there will be uh, uh, great efforts to prevent this on the part of the United States and its close allies. Uh, if you look over the international scene, the strongest support for Israeli policies has been uh, what's called the Anglosphere. Uh, Britain's, the offshoots of Britain, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia. Uh, and I think that's where the resistance will remain, but uh, uh, they can't divorce themselves from the world. If there's more moves in this direction in Europe, it will strengthen efforts in the United States to pressure the U.S. government to join the world on this issue. Uh, and uh, that can have an impact. Can I ask everybody to silence their phones, please? Uh, can we have the gentleman? Uh, Nizar Aboud of al Mayadeen Television in Beirut. Mr. Trump, I'm from al Mayadeen Television in Beirut. Mr. Chomsky, uh, you said a few years ago that democracy is forbidden in the Middle East and it's forbidden by the United States. This was your statement in 2011. Do you still believe like that? And how do you envisage the future of the area after the emergence of ISIS, ISIL, and Nusra and their affiliates? Well, we have a good indication of um, what the US attitude is towards democracy. 
There's many examples. So, for example, there was the most dramatic is uh, the one truly free election that took place in the Arab world. Um, there are elections, but they're always constrained in one or another way. There was a very free election, carefully monitored, uh, declared to be free and fair in January 2006 in Palestine. How did the U.S. respond? By immediately moving to punish the Palestinians for voting the wrong way in a free election, uh, the U.S. immediately began to organize a military coup uh, to try to overthrow the government. Uh, it was preempted in 2007 that led to the takeover of Hamas and uh, Gaza. That was the immediate reaction to the first free and open uh, democratic election. It's not the only case. Uh, free elections are... Uh, everyone calls for democracy. Stalin called for democracy. Everyone loves democracy, but only when it comes out the way we want it to. And, uh, and that's demonstrated over and over. I uh, don't want to say it's an iron law, but the tendency is overwhelming. The lady in the red, please. I didn't get to the ISIS point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll come back. Uh, I think it's very hard to predict. Uh, ISIS is a... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is a background. Uh, the uh, uh, Recently, uh, uh, Paul Pilar, one of... CIA, uh, long background in the CIA, uh, mostly on the Middle East, uh, leading specialist, uh, stated the United States created ISIS. Uh, Graham Fuller, also long background in the CIA, uh, leading analyst of Middle East policies, recently had an article uh, headlined, The United States Created ISIS. Uh, both of them said, look, we didn't, the U.S. didn't actually create it. It simply created the conditions from which it arose. When uh, the fragile society of Iraq, fragile for all kinds of reasons we can go into, but when that society was hit by a sledgehammer and smashed to pieces, uh, lots of very unpleasant and ugly consequences arose, quite apart from the destruction, the killings, the exiles, and so on. One of them was inciting sectarian conflict. Uh, previously, it had been pretty subdued. So Baghdad was a mixed city. Uh, people lived all over. And often people didn't even know whether their neighbor was Sh Shiite or Sunni. Like, you don't know if your neighbor is one or another branch of Protestant, let's say. Uh, within a short time after the invasion, U.S.-British invasion, uh, the, uh, which immediately imposed sectarian divisions, uh, sectarian conflicts began to arise. Uh, out of this, they're, not, they're tearing Iraq to shreds, they're tearing the regions to shreds. An extremist uh, fringe developed ISIS, uh, which is an extremist branch of the most extreme fundamentalist branch of Islam, a Saudi a Wahhabi Salafi doctrine, already extremist. This one, an extremist branch of it. It's... Uh, Military victories are quite startling. It's hard to think of anything like it. I mean, the Iraqi army is 350,000 men. It's an army that has fought bitter wars. Uh, in the case of Iran, it's a serious war went on for years. Well-trained army, willing to stand up for a nationalist struggle, uh, arm, heavily armed, trained by the United States for over a decade. As soon as a couple of thousand lightly armed jihadi appears, the generals ran away and the soldiers had to flee after them. The whole army collapsed. Uh, what's, that's a pretty unusual event in history. Uh, the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish uh, militia, was able partly to hold off ISIS, but apparently the main fighting we don't have a lot of evidence, but it appears that the main fighting is probably being done by the PKK, the um, the Kurdish, uh, uh, Turkish-based, not actually based in northern Iraq, Mount Kandil, but Kurdish, uh, Turkish background, uh, Kurdish forces, the ones that Turkey attacked yesterday. Yeah, Vice but, President, sorry, just mm -hmm. for a quick follow-up. Uh, Vice President first accused the allies, the Gulf allies, uh, 
of conniving with ISIS. The, uh, the Vice President Biden, U.S. Vice President George uh, Biden, he accused oh, the allies. Yes, well, he accused the allies of conniving or helping ISIS, and then he apologized. How he, do he you didn't actually say they were allied with ISIS. He said support. what he said was accurate. He said they leave the border open. Uh, they leave ISIS, They uh, leave the opportunity for ISIS to strengthen itself. He did say that, but we, uh, Turkey we, says the same thing. We would like to give everybody a chance. What they say is they will not, uh, and not a, they, they will not focus on ISIS unless it also strikes at their enemies. Their enemies are, first of all, the Assad regime, and secondly, the Kurdish, uh, um, the PKK, and the, uh, the Kurdish linked Kurdish groups in Syria, which they don't want to uh, expand and gain autonomy. I mean, Erdogan virtually says it directly. Uh, Biden almost didn't have to say it. And once, the once, actions uh, demonstrate it. Once we give everybody a chance, we can have some time for follow-up. Go ahead, please. Professor Chomsky, it's very, very uh, wonderful to have you here again. Do you see any connection between U.S. policy toward Palestine and uh, U.S. policies elsewhere in the globe, um, any similarity of interest or tendency. And you also said uh, that the U.S. population would have to exert pressure on the government. But in one of your writings, you spoke of the, uh, the media's acceptable spectrum of dissent. And since the media uh, appears to be, the mainstream media, very largely in support of whatever the U.S. policy is, how would the information get to the American people so that they could have an impact on the government? Well, to begin with the second point, and remind me if I forget the first, uh, because it's, an import, it's important. Uh, that's what you just described is true of every issue. It was true of um, the war in Vietnam. It was true of the Central American wars. It was true of South Africa. It was uh, true of the... Timorese struggle I was involved in for many years. You pick it, it's always the same. The media pretty much hewed to the government's line, little pushing, stretching here and there, but it's pretty overwhelming. So take, say, Vietnam, uh, which finally, ultimately became a major popular movement which did influence policy. How did it begin? Uh, I can tell you I was involved. Uh, in, in the early 1960s, I started trying to give talks about Vietnam. Actually, I live in Boston, which is probably the most liberal city in the country, the universities, academics, professionals. Uh, uh, I would give talks in uh, somebody's living room or, or in a church with maybe four people. Uh, we'd have to, if we tried to talk about it, we'd have to bring in half a dozen other issues to try to get a small group of people to show up. Uh, by 1965, October 1965, the anti-war activists decided to join in the first international day of protest. October 15th, 1965 was called as an international day of protest against the war in Vietnam. There were big demonstrations all over the world. And we decided to try to have a demonstration in Boston on the Boston Common. That's the standard place for public meetings and so on. Uh, it was broken up violently. I was supposed to be one of the speakers. Nobody could hear any of the speakers. Uh, the only reason we weren't killed was there were lots of state police around who didn't like what we were saying but didn't want bloodshed on the Boston Common. You take a look at the Boston Globe the next day, the leading liberal newspaper in the country. Bitter denunciation of the demonstrators. How dare these unpatriotic demonstrators say, let's not bomb North Vietnam and so on. Congress, the same. Liberal congressmen, uh, Mike Mansfield, others, same denunciations. Uh, the next international day of protest was in March 1966. We realized we couldn't have a public open protest, so we organized it in a church. Church was attacked. Tin cans, tomatoes. Uh, uh, that, uh, and you have to remember what was happening then. In 1966, there were a quarter of a million, almost 300,000 American troops in South Vietnam. South Vietnam had been practically destroyed by then, and the war was expanding to North Vietnam, and though it wasn't known then, into Cambodia and Laos. Uh, 
And at that point, it was still, the, it was almost impossible to have a public protest without violence. Well, a couple of years later, things had changed. And the same is true in every other issue. Actually, I testified at the United Nations on East Timor in 1978. Uh, the press wouldn't even come. They didn't want to hear about it. Uh, the U.S. was providing all of, almost all of the arms to Indonesia for a huge massacre, virtually genocidal. But the press just wasn't interested. And who cares, you know? Uh, but finally it got out, you know, there was significant pressure or something happened. It can be the same this way. On the first issue, U.S. policy is like that of every other great power. Uh, there are what are called national interests. Uh, they have nothing to do with the nation. Uh, they have to do with centers of power within the nation. So the national interest is not to protect the population. It's easy to demonstrate that. I won't go through the details. But policy is designed for the to protect and expand state power and the power of concentrated, the, the, the domestic concentration of powers in the United States, that's mostly the corporate sector, various sectors of it. And policy is designed for that end. Well, you look at the history of U.S.-Israel relations and it conforms pretty well to that. In 1948, uh, the uh, Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, military, were quite impressed by Israel's military victories, uh, and they described Israel as potentially a significant U.S. base in the Middle East. In fact, they described it, Israel as the second largest military force after Turkey, NATO, NATO member, and a potential uh, valued ally. Uh, the uh, very significant to the United, the most significant issue to the United States is the oil reserves of the region. They were regarded as a, a stupendous source of strategic power, greatest material prize in world history, mostly in Saudi Arabia, also in the Emirates. Uh, but the, uh, a lot of documents have been released. Saudi Arabia made it pretty clear that they were not going to object to U.S. support for, uh, for Israel. They had their own reasons, which we could go into. Uh, but... Uh, uh, and so it continued, and it was, not a, it was a, not a very intimate relationship, and there were conflicts, like in 56. But in 1958, when there was a real problem for the U.S. and Britain in the Middle East, uh, what happened is that in Iraq, uh, the, uh, U, the British-run government was overthrown by a military coup. That was the first break in the Anglo-American condominium over Middle East oil. And that was taken very seriously. Uh, the US sent troops to Lebanon. They were apparently armed with nuclear weapons. Uh, there were, uh, the British sent troops to Jordan. It was quite a major re reaction to that. Israel was the only state that cooperated with the United States. You look at the internal US records, which are declassified. They recognized that Israel was the one cooperative state. In fact, the CIA came out with an analysis in '58 saying that uh, support for Israel is a logical corollary of our opposition to what they call radical Arab nationalism. Radical means independent. Uh, that was the real enemy. By then it was Nasser's Egypt. Uh, 1967, it was a major change. Uh, Israel performed a huge service to the United States, enormous. And U.S. policy toward Israel totally changed and reached its pretty much its present state. Uh, what happened, if you look back, was there was a major conflict between two forces in the Arab world, uh, radical Islamic fundamentalism based in Saudi Arabia and secular nationalism based in Egypt. Uh, during Britain's dominance of the region, it had generally supported radical Islamic fundamentalism. And the U.S. took that over for good reasons. The real enemy is secular nationalism. They don't mind radical fundamentalism. Uh, and uh, there was a war going on in, in Yemen between Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Uh, Israel pretty much smashed secular nationalism. It was a tremendous gift both to Saudi Arabia and to the United States. And it solidified a relationship that was uh, 
already reasonably friendly and created essentially the current situation. Uh, I, there's no time to run through the rest of the record, but it's essentially like that. Actually, we saw an interesting illustration of it just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you remember in the midst of Operation Protective Edge, when Israel was smashing Gaza, the attack was so extreme, they were beginning to run out of, ammuni of uh, munitions. And it's a very heavily armed country. So they appealed to the United States for more munitions. And munitions were, in fact, transferred to Israel by the Pentagon in the middle of the fighting. They were transferred from stocks that the United States prepositions in Israel for use by U.S. forces. That's one of innumerable indications of the nature of the alliance. And there's much more like this. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, uh, leaks from WikiLeaks, which didn't get the attention it should have, uh, was a list of uh, highly significant strategic locations, so significant that for the U.S. that we have to protect them at all costs. One of them was right outside Haifa, Rafael Military Industries, which is a major advanced uh, military industrial installation, one of the places where they pioneered drone technology, for example, uh, so closely linked to the United States that Rafael actually transferred its business operations to Washington, where the money is. Very tight linkages. Uh, same with capital flows and many other things. Uh, so the United States is pursuing the interest you'd expect of a great power. I On the that. other hand, what do the Palestinians offer the United States? They're weak. They're powerless. Uh, they have no wealth. Uh, they have only the most tepid support from the Arab rulers. You know, They have to make some gestures of support to quiet their own populations, but nothing real. So no power, no wealth, therefore no rights. Those are, we may not like it, but uh, those are the laws of international relations. Uh, the gentleman in the Czech shirt, and then we have time for only one or two more, please. Hi, Professor Chomsky. My name is uh, Sherwin Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. Uh, I wonder if you're aware of the passing on Sunday of the Kenyan uh, African intellectual Ali Mazri, who uh, taught in upstate New York. You, you were on the uh, foreign policy top 100 global thinkers list in 2005. And he shared similar strands to your thinking on, on the, Arab, uh, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I wonder if you could share a few thoughts on the occasion of his passing. If, if I could comment on his... On his vision. passing and, and your, yeah, your experiences yeah, with him. He just died a few days ago. Very, on Sunday. Yeah, very important intellectual. I mean, I would like to answer your question, but before doing it, I would want to look back and read carefully, because it's memories, I don't like to talk about them. But he wrote very influential and important work on this and other issues, anti-colonial issues. Please, ma'am, in the green. Um, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim. I'm from Al Arabi Al Jadid newspaper. My question is regarding BDS and your position on BDS, and the, especially in America, and the fact that the talking about mainly about institutions and cultural and academic boycott. Thank you. Well, BDS is a, it's not a principle, it's a tactic. It's a collection of tactics. Uh, anyone who's involved in any form of activism, it is second nature to ask a simple question about tactics. Are they going to work? That's the question you ask about tactics. What are you trying to achieve? And is a particular choice of tactics likely to succeed? Or is a choice of tactics likely to backfire? Which can happen. So for example, take Vietnam again. Um, at the peak of popular opposition, uh, around 1970, a lot of young people in the United States were so angry and desperate that they wanted to do something really extreme and not just try to um, carry out educational programs or influence Congress or support resistance or whatever, but to march down Main Street and smash up banks, the weathermen. Uh, that was a tactic. The Vietnamese were strongly opposed to it because they could understand something. That tactic is going to alienate the population and is going to lead to increasing support for violence and terror. So that's the wrong tactic. You can understand the motivation. But that doesn't make it the right tactic. And that, that's general. The BDS movement 
unfortunately, has failed to understand this lesson adequately. Other movements have. These are sensible tactics if they are selected in such a way as to have uh, a positive effect, not a negative effect. Now, first of all, it's not BDS, it's BD. Sanctions come from states, and we have not reached the point in Palestinian solidarity where states are taking actions. Uh, the one major exception to this, and it's an important one, partial exception, is the European Union directive uh, to uh, break relations with uh, institutions engage, involved in the occupied territories. Now, that's significant if implemented. Uh, the uh, Presbyterian Church in the United States took a similar resolution, that's boycott and divestment, and crucially, it was aimed also at U.S. multinationals that are involved in the occupation, and that's significant. Uh, where BD-type actions are taken to make life uncomfortable for Israelis, they may have some value, but it's not really where the core of the problem lies. They have to change U.S. policy. And it's possible, to, and if you look at the you take a look at the BDS, instantly these actions were going on before the BDS movement was formed. So these are tactics that many of us have been using for years. Uh, the BDS movement itself has three principles. Um, they vary a little in formulation, but basically uh, a, a sanction and boycott, boycott BDS actions against Israel as long as it maintains the control of the occupied territories. That's the first. The second is uh, as long as there is discrimination against Palestinians within Israel. The third is until Israel allows the refugees to return. All right, now, if you're an activist, you ask yourself one question. Which of these tactics, what is the effect going to be of these tactics? And the answer is transparent. Transparent in advance, and it's transparent from looking at the record. Uh, actions directed against the occupation have been successful. Effective, successful, uh, also targeting European and US institutions, understandable, and have the very positive effect of opening up discussion and debate in the Western countries so that people come to understand what they're involved in. All of that's important. You take a look at actions concerned with the refugees, zero effect. If, it ever, if anything's ever brought up, it usually has a negative effect because it leads to a backlash saying you're trying to destroy Israel. The groundwork, no groundwork has been laid for it. In the middle case, uh, uh, repression uh, against uh, Palestinians inside Israel, which does exist. I've been writing about it for years. It's serious. But it raises a question. Uh, why not boycott the United States? Okay. It's serious. You take a look at African-American history in the United States. I won't go through it, but it's grotesque. Uh, 500 years, and there's maybe uh, since the first slaves came, and a couple of decades, literally, when there was a more or less opportunity for freedom, and this isn't one of them. Uh, raises that question. Well, maybe there are answers to that question, but you have to lay the groundwork for it in educational and organizational activities, and that hasn't been done. The result is that actions of that kind have usually led to a backlash which is harmful to the Palestinians. These are the kinds of questions you have to ask about tactics all the time. As I said, it's second nature in activist groups. You don't just say, look, I, uh, I like this, it makes me feel good. It's right in principle somehow. You have to ask, what's the impact on the victims? That's the question you constantly have to ask, and that should be the guiding principle. You can have debate and discussion about it, but that should be the guideline. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I think we just have time for one more question. I'm very sorry, but there will be a Q&A at the end of the other session. Um, please, in the check shirt. Sorry. The gentleman behind you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Christopher Ronenberg with the Norwegian newspaper Aftenposten. Thanks for taking my question. 
Um, you were talking about why the U.S. Uh, behaves the way it does towards Israel. Um, now that the U.S. is becoming more and more self-reliant on oil and other fossil fuels, how can that change the geopolitics of the region and, in particular, the U.S. behavior towards Israel? I don't think it will change it at all. Please give a chance to that. Lady sure. Then Please. Please questions. go ahead. Uh, okay. And then we'll wrap okay, it up. I'll try to go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello, um, I'm Anna from Armenia. First of all, Professor Chomsky, I wanted to thank you for your brilliant contribution to science and for your unyielding political activism. We admire you in my country, Armenia, very much for that. You were not afraid to raise your voice, even risking being unpopular, and I think you became even more popular after that. My question is this. There were some reports about genocidal massacres in Middle East and also in Iraq and Syria towards Kurds and Yazidis. And speaking of genocidal issues, I can't but remember the uh, first genocide of uh, 20th century, Armenian genocide in 1915, when the term itself, genocide, by Raphael Lemkin was used first when it was created, when he referred to Armenian genocide being deeply shaken by that. Next year, we will mark 100 years since this horrible event happened. What's your stand about this? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, let me first talk about the oil. Um, I don't, my brief answer, I don't think it'll have any effect at all. And we have good reasons to assume that. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, the United States was the major oil producer in the world. Didn't use Middle East oil, it was exporting oil. Policies are exactly the same. Uh, and if you look through the record, uh, say take uh, when Alaska oil came on stream finally after the uh, rise in oil prices in the early 70s, which the U.S. was not opposed to, incidentally, because uh, U.S. corporations gained, U.S. producers gained. Uh, the Alaskan oil mostly went to Asia. Uh, uh, you take a look at the Keystone XL pipeline, the big excitement now. If it's built, the oil that goes to the Louisiana refineries are probably going to go somewhere else, not to the United States. Uh, the issue all along has not been access. It's been control, and that's quite different. If the U.S. was uh, running 100 percent on solar energy, I think it would have the same policies towards the Middle East. Uh, you want to, it's, it's a very powerful instrument of control to have your hand on the spigot, and that's been understood. So you go back 1950, roughly, uh, George Kennan, leading creator of the modern international political system, he explained internally that uh, if the United States controls Middle East oil, it will have veto power over Japanese actions because it will control Japan's energy resources. You come right up to the present, as Bigniew Brzezinski, one of the main planners, uh, he, he was kind of critical about the invasion of Iraq, but he nevertheless said that a good side of it would be that uh, if it worked, and the U.S. could control Iraqi oil, which it didn't need, uh, it would have critical leverage over its European allies. Allies means potential enemies. They've got to keep them under control. That's great power politics. And all the way through, that's been true. It's a, still a huge resource, huge potential resource, and control over it and where it goes is a significant instrument in world affairs. Uh, so I personally don't think that the, in, you know, the U.S. is now becoming, again, a major exporter, which is a disaster for the world. Um, we should not forget that we are really playing with fire. Uh, every drop of oil that's extracted from the ground is another blow in the coffin of the human species. We're coming pretty close to a precipice where we're going to destroy the uh, conditions for decent existence. And unless most of that oil stays in the ground where it has to be, uh, the future for our grandchildren is not very bright. This is constantly neglected when you read the euphoria about uh, uh, the fracking and so on. You read the business press today, uh, they're very excited because the price of gasoline is going to go down in the United States. That's a catastrophe. For the price of gasoline to go down is an utter catastrophe, not a time for euphoria, at least if you can think beyond you know, how many commodities you can buy tomorrow, if you think about, say, the world your grandchildren will live in. This is just obvious. 
Uh, but unfortunately, it's not the driving force in policy. Uh, anyhow, to get back to the explicit question, I don't think that there will be an impact on policy because the issue has always been control, not access. And what is your opinion on the genocide of the Armenians, Armenian which was the first in 20th century? Well, actually, I was in Turkey uh, about a year ago to give the uh, memorial lecture for Rantink, the uh, Tur uh, Turkish-Armenian journalist who exposed the Armenian massacres. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, it was a huge atrocity, no question about that. A very complex one. So the first time I was in Turkey, for example, was around 2000. And I, I was there to support Kurdish rights. I was there for a trial and so on. And among other things, I went to Diyarbakir, uh, where Kurdish, uh, the Kurds had just been subjected to uh, really horrible atrocities in Turkey right through the 90s. It was awful. And this was kind of the tail end of it. And I was taken in Diyarbakir by Kurdish friends to, I asked to visit the Armenian quarter. Diyarbakir was the place where the final massacres took place, mostly by Kurds. I um, mean, the, the, the internal psychological conflicts are hard to describe. Um, they themselves were just barely emerging from major slaughters, incidentally backed by the United States, which provided about 80% of the arms. And here they were being, uh, I was asking them to show me the remnants of a massacre in which they were among the major perpetrators, the final almost, I hate to use the words, but almost a final solution for the Armenians in, in Turkey. Well, they took me. Now, there was an old church, one church, falling apart, no roof, you know, pieces, total wreck, but remnants of the building were there. I asked if uh, anyone had collected the relics, and they were uncomfortable about it. But they took me to a little store nearby, a small store, where there was an Armenian man, roughly my age, who uh, had uh, collected relics from the church. And that was about the remnants of the Armenian community in Djarbakir. I mean, I'm not Which was Armenian Tigran Akarit. I was there last year for the Hrant Dink lecture. Very substantial change. The church had been rebuilt, reconstituted. Uh, there's, um, at the Hrant Dink memorial, there were probably hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating big march through Istanbul, uh, supporting, uh, bringing up the truth about the Armenian massacres. Uh, the police didn't interfere. It was too big a, too big a demonstration to interfere with. Uh, the final, it ended at the uh, publishing house where Hrantink worked and where he was assassinated. And uh, his wife, his widow was there. I was there and there was a big crowd talks and so on. It's an enormous change and a positive one. So on that, on that note, should, sir. it was a terrible atrocity, but there's now the beginnings of coming to terms with it. It's not easy. Uh, other countries have similar problems. I, I mentioned before that the support for Israel is primarily from the Anglosphere. Think about the Anglosphere for a minute. Uh, what makes those countries similar? the United States, Australia, and Canada. These are settler colonial societies, societies where the English colonists came and virtually exterminated the indigenous population, all of them. Not everybody, but horrible atrocities. Have we come to terms with Why would this, might this be related to support for Israel? Well, I don't think it's hard to figure out especially when you recognize that these are extremely religious societies with extreme fundamentalist religious elements which take a literalist interpretation of the Bible. You put all that together and it's a cultural fact over and above the geopolitical facts that lie behind this. Have these societies come to terms with their extermination of the indigenous population? It's a long time. It hasn't happened. Have they come to terms with the legacy of slavery, which is still alive, remember? You look at, look at the number of black males in prison. That's the legacy of slavery, 500 years. Have they come to terms with it? No. Turkey is beginning to come to terms with a major crime, and I think that should be 
applauded and supported, but uh, without taking a superior stance. There Thank are very you. few countries that don't have something to look back on. Thank you very much, sir. On that, uh, we do have the session in the General Assembly Hall. Uh, we'd like to invite you to the General Assembly. Thank you.